let's kick this off. Sure. Let's do an intro. So Eric <laughs> Sue, Eric Sue and I got connected on Clubhouse, right? We did. And um, Does that, that's how you guys met. That's yes. how we met. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. a lot of good people get to meet on Clubhouse back in the day. Today, that's the only value I got from that meeting a couple Absolutely. of great people. Yeah, that's what you Which said too. Though. I never got into it, and he was ripping on me last night for not getting into Clubhouse. Well, no, no. There you was saved a, a lot of hours. I mean, there's days where I spent like 14 hours on that. Yes. It was bad. Clubhouse was crazy. Clubhouse was when everyone were at home. Not able to get out, so yeah. minus Miami, um, and that's where <laughs> that's it true. became a thing, right? So I was, I just, you know, I broke up with my ex, and I was by myself at night, uh, not sad or anything, but I was in Clubhouse, suddenly you get connected with friends that you have seen before, suddenly new friends and all that, and one of the good people I met was Eric Sue, uh, at the time he just moved to Miami, he was a COVID refugee, right? I moved to down. Miami a little bit after, but yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit after. Yeah. And uh, so Eric is um, he's a marketer, a businessman, and a multimillionaire, self made, very young guy uh, to claim for that deed, but he, he did very, very good for himself. And I feel like every time we talk, we I come out smarter, and I wanted to bring him on the show so everyone else can come out smarter. Eric, a um, couple words about yourself. Couple words. Well, thanks. I mean, a I get smarter every time I talk to you guys. So <laughs> you're very kind. <laughs> um, no, I mean, as as Joe or Yosef says, uh, podcaster, marketer. Um, I love early stage investing, and uh, yeah, I just love learning and teaching. I think if you're to strip away everything, like what do I actually enjoy doing? I just love learning and teaching. So this, like, yeah. I'm learning from you guys, and hopefully we get to teach some things to the audience. So yeah. Yeah, I mean that's why we're doing it. That's why that's why I started podcasting. That's literally what you started doing too. It's just a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. You get to chill with really smart people. Um, where where did you, I, you know I actually I did a background uh, I did a background I did a podcast with you when you launched your or released your book. Yeah. Um, and I actually don't even remember because I don't think I did a good job of it. <laughs> <laughs> in hindsight, like actually asking where you came from, yeah, because you weren't just always in agencies. But I don't now. I'm foggy about where you actually came from. So did yeah. you exit a company, build one up, work for somebody, pivot yeah. to agency? I don't know that story. I was actually telling Joe that the the story. Um, so, um, I was leading marketing at a at a tech startup before, and there's a whole story. we can come back to that story in a little bit because I actually tried to buy the company a year ago. Um, That's funny. So so <laughs> so um, but. This startup I was at, I basically um, bet the entire company. I gambled the entire company on YouTube ads because I, I started there and the CEO was like, hey, like numbers aren't going well. I was like, dude, I, I've been here for a month. And he's like, yeah, numbers aren't going well. Like if we don't hit numbers this month, we're going to have to let you go. I was like, okay. So then I was like, okay, all in because I come from a gambling background, right? Yeah. So all in. And it worked out. Like we were acquiring like, you know, 500, 600 users a month. And it was an online education company. And then we shot up to like 5,000 a month. And then we're off to the races, got our Series B and all that. Um, then I was um, my, my friend, Neil Patel, who I do a, a podcast with now, um, he was like, dude, like you help this company. Can you help save this agency? And I was like, not interested. Cause I'm like, oh, I'm in tech. I'm too good for agency. Right. And so, <laughs> so then, so then I'm like, but then I reframed it. I was like, wait, 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 if I can save this crappy company, I think I can do anything. And so came into, um, single grain, long story short, um, that's a name, single grain, single grain the the ad agency, agency that I own now. That yeah. you own right now yes. Six months into it, the, um, founders, original founders decided that, that they wanted out and the work that we were doing was no longer working anymore because of Google's algorithm updates. And so I was like, Hey, you know what? I'll take it over. And so I was 27 years old, had no business even trying to run a company. Um, I bought Neil's shares for, for I paid a dollar for 10% of his shares. And I paid another dollar for his partner's um, shares. Um, and then the rest was seller finance. I didn't even know what the term seller financing meant. And actually I promptly, it's like, oh, what a win, Eric. You're so smart. But then I actually made the company go from bad to worse. A year later, the outside accounting firm was like, hey, it might be time to shut this thing down. And I was like, <laughs> so, so I ended up taking, um, I, I actually had accepted a job offer that was like pretty lucrative. Um, and and you're going to go back to like work for someone. I was going to go yeah. work for someone. And then this is, this is like, oh, like 2014, by the way. And then, and then like, I was just like, all right, so you're not that young actually. What, what am I talking about? I said, yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty old. Yeah. yeah. And so, so I was like, do, we, do people cuss on this show? Yeah. yeah. So I was like, fuck, I can't do this. So, <laughs> so, so, and, and then like, I was actually looking at apartments in uptown Dallas. I was like, and da- nothing, nothing wrong with Dallas, guys. Which is not for me. We love Dallas. But, yeah. yeah, we love Dallas. So I was like, I can't do it. And then um, I was like, let's do it. Went all in, and then um, on, on the company, and we slowly were able to build it up. But I just learned a lot in that year. So that's how I eventually took over Single Grain, and then um, made it into what it is now. And then I just tell really, them what it is now. 
It's, so, well, yeah, it's, it's your, still your agency. It's still your yeah. baby, but that's sort of yeah. been the thing. How that, many employees do you have now? So we have about 60. Um, it's an eight-figure business. I'll leave it at that. And then um, last year, we bought two other agencies. And I really just like the cash flow from the agency to continue to help um, build out other stuff, right? It's built the podcast. It's mm -hmm. built out other stuff. And the great thing is, like, I, I actually did a little shorts the other day talking about how, like, I know a couple people that have agencies, bootstrap them up to, like, north of nine figures, right? One guy just goes and buys internet businesses. Um, and then obviously my podcast co-host bootstrapped it to north of a hundred million in like four years. And then um, you have like obviously the Gary V's of the world. So it's actually a great business. I used to poo poo on it cause I was like, oh, it's service and it's not scalable. But reality is you can actually, the multiples you can get on the agency are not. So I'll, I'll pause for a second cause I've been talking for a bit. No, I actually saw, I saw your, um, your either, I, th I think I saw it on, on Instagram, yeah. the short that you made talking about how can you grow it to about a hundred million in sale. And, and that's, that's true because when you look at companies, the, there is no knowledge everywhere what, what, what we do, right? Internet marketing, a social media marketing is not something that everybody knows. And when you don't know, you don't know who's good, right? So there's a lot of reference of who's good. And eventually when you find someone that works for you, you let them run your business. Mm -hmm. And agencies come in and they take a big chunk of a lot of companies' money. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they know what they're doing. Hopefully. Uh, yeah, hopefully they know yeah. what they're doing. A lot of them are good with promoting themselves more than the actual... Mm -hmm company that I would argue most agencies suck at promoting them a hundred percent I would also argue that most agencies suck but uh, uh, yes in general yeah. so I, I hated agencies before. I was like why would I do this they, they've always been crappy whenever I've worked with them when I was like in-house why would I do this it's such a terrible business and then you realize oh it's in reality if you have an agency that is really good the idea is you say well I'll pay you a lot of money but I want exclusivity for for example for that category mm -hmm. don't do those competitors for for instance and the ones that are but Oftentimes, I found that companies that do well with an agency, it's because someone in the agency had some epiphany, some new tactic, not even a strategy, how to go and push some content well. It has a short lifespan, and then eventually they're back to square, square one, but they keep the agency forever because they're not literate of how they did this, and it just they roll with that, with that company forever, and now they're just not doing the same job. They don't produce the same. It's, uh, I, I always believe that companies should learn how to promote, to do marketing themselves. You bring an ad agency to work alongside as if you have another employee. And then you say, listen, we can work. And if you do better than, than our team, good. Our team is going to come up tomorrow with something new, but, but it, it makes more sense. Or to fill in gaps where there's going to be a shortage of employees or so on, where you can go and take on and, and do that. But I think I always say like you have to understand marketing. Otherwise, you wouldn't even know who's a good agency. I'll tell you the game with the, with you know the nine figure plus agencies. It's literally, it's hiring people that have been account managers at these other agencies, mm. right? And they have all the relationship because it's all relationship driven. Like yeah. we we have someone that um, was with us at a publicly traded health company, and then she went over to Lyft, and then she went over to this other company. She's been following us the whole time. Same with someone else that was like a, at a steel company, publicly traded. And then she moved over to NASDAQ, right? Mm -hmm. And they've just like, once you, you're comfortable with someone, you know, like, and trust them, you just, so then what happens is as you grow bigger, you just keep hiring these account directors and people that have grown these agencies, been there, done that. Yeah, even if they bring 30% yeah. of the roller decks, it's, it's worth home. it. It pays yeah. for itself. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and so like, that's literally how they, they ramp. And like, even you would think that a lot of the lead flow comes from the agency, but no, it's like 50 plus percent referral for these nine figure plus agencies. Yeah. But how do you actually find, okay, so if you're a company, I just want to go back to your point, because um, I've had the issue of hiring an agency that sucks and hiring mm -hmm. repeat agencies that just don't deliver, right? Yeah. So um, as a company, how do you find an agency that can actually market for you, act, at, act as that outsourced employee? Mm -hmm. What do you look for in an agency? How do you audit them? Because that's probably a big pain point that people are like early stage found all the way through to late stage that are just trying to tack on or bolt on a marketing department. Yeah. I, I don't think the three of us here would actually go find an agency. I think we would go find like, like an individual that's been there, done that. So if I were to look for like a good marketer, I'd actually just use one of those sites like marketerhire.com. I love marketer great hire. People. Yeah. yeah. And then that's what I would do. And then, and then the only agencies I would really take a look at would be like these pay for, like if we're talking about media, like I have a couple of friends that have these paid media agencies. It's pay for performance only. Yeah. One guy does like 57 million a year and he has like 20 employees. Um, but it's literally, he just focuses on the finance niche and it's all pay for performance. And so AK, you don't pay us until we perform. That, that, that's a pretty damn good offer. Yeah. Um, versus like right now, like uh, yesterday, like um, a couple days ago, like people were asking me, it's like, oh, 
you know, we, we have this one client that wants to spend a couple million dollars a month. Like, what should we be charging? Or should we be charging a percentage? Like, even in my mind, it's like, it, that doesn't really compute. I'm like, they could just go build a team, you know? So, like, I just, yeah. again, it goes back to looking at great individuals, and I'd probably go for them first, and then i go for the performance But when, do you, when you don't know, like, when you don't have, look, I, I, I hired uh, uh, someone that was the CMO of Carnival Cruise Line. And, uh, oh. And then, I mean, obviously, it's a mistake because what the hell do they know about marketing? But still, still, what you learn is the way they operate, they're not trying to build anything themselves if it's a corporate company because if there is a failure, it's on them. If I hire an agency and I work for a corporation, that agency fell. Don't blame me. They like to cover. So, and that's when you see lots of companies die. If you want to see uh, the morgue for companies, is the companies that just get agencies to do oh, everything that's for a, them. A, a ultimate the, CYA, cover yeah. your ass weapon. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But yes. like, it, like, <laughs> so when I when I walked into my current company, mm -hmm. we were spending just shy of 50k a month mm -hmm. on an agency that the ROAS was like insignificant yeah. on the total between the ad spend plus the agency fees. Yeah. So, I mean, you do have to, you have to balance that out because of course, 50,000, you could hire a whole marketing team, but there's a lot of cheaper agencies that you could work with. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what was my point with this? Oh, it's just that as a, as an early stage founder, you don't know where to spend your money. So mm -hmm. paid performance is great, but you also may not be able to like, know who to hire either because you've never hired a marketer before or, yep. you know you're trying to build something off the ground so well i think it's important to define the, the the outcomes i think most people go for the job description first and they just yeah. like i used to like just cut and paste and then like went wrong many times there but it's like like well let's say i'm looking to hire a ceo like maybe they've managed a hundred million dollar pnl they've built out an executive team and then i'm like grading them on those three to five outcomes um and then like I think most people don't think about those outcomes. And so when you start interviewing these people, you're not testing for those questions. You start asking a bunch of bullshit, like yeah. inconsistent questions. And that leads to terrible results because you ask terrible questions. That goes back to yeah. your sense. point, the story that you always tell about when you hire a marketer, what would you do with a... Yeah, I go, this, I go yeah. tactical. My, my yeah. thing was when I hire a person, and you can only do it if you actually understand, if you know what, mm -hmm. if, if it's marketing, then yeah. It's like a mechanic, uh, like if you have a, a car shop, right? You're a mechanic. You ask a mechanic, okay, what do you do if the, car, the, the crankshaft on Chevy 67 is broke? You'll ask those tactical questions to mm -hmm. see if he knows what, what, what he's talking about. So when I ask questions, I wanted to understand, was you, did you actually get your hands dirty? Did you do, okay, so you did on a low level with 5,000 because my question was $5,000, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Shoot. You run a company, you run a marketing with 5,000. Now I give you 100,000. Now I give you a million dollars. So I want to see, have you ever scaled? So don't just tell me you're, you're a kid that only did a little marketing by himself and that's where you stopped and then I'm going to try to hire you as a director. No, mm -hmm. you need to know a little bit more than that, right? But then don't tell me I was a manager. I was parachuted. I've never actually got my hands dirty. I've never actually had my, my account. I never opened an account on on uh, Google Ads since I have nothing. Mm -hmm. So if, if I, and I can, you, you can only tell that by, by tac tactical questions. So that, yeah. that was my. You're, 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 what you're doing is you're testing for their strategic thinking at the yes. end of the day. And so like what we do is we have people fill out a written prompt. So maybe there's those three to five tactical questions. And let's say Scott, like you and I don't, we're not like designers, right? Yeah. I mean, maybe you might be, but like, um, I'm so not. like I, I might go to I'm one not. of my, this like, is the designer. Yeah, very designed well. I'm just, um, I'm just in Canva. That's it. That's not the extent of my design skills. So, so we would go to our, like our yeah. really good design friend and then say, Hey, like what questions would you ask? And could you help me evaluate yes. these questions? Yeah. Um, that's the easy way, the easier way out. That's smart. Yeah. You know, the, the toughest one for me was to hire an AI person. Mm. Right, no one in the company had a clue what to ask, what anything. Right, even my uh, nothing. So the first one was just a punch in your teeth. It was just horrible. Yeah. And uh, and one 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 thing I did learn when you hire a person, any person, right? It doesn't matter if it's AI or whatever it is. Sometimes you'll find people with PhD, but they'll be more intimidating because you think they're smart and they're genius. And but then you said, okay, go to basic. Let's see if they understand the actual business. Can you put it in the lamest terms? How are you going to go and fix that problem that I have? If I couldn't understand that, I'm not hiring you. Yep. You needed to understand my business. Yep. So if, if you're doing AI, you have to put it later on in zeros and ones. 
Can I actually add on a point to that, though? I do believe that people don't ask for help enough. What I mean by that is if there is a complicated role, like an AI role, and you've never hired for AI and you don't have anyone in your network, if you actually just reach out to people that were in AI at Google on LinkedIn and said, hey, I'm a first time founder or I'm an early stage founder trying to hire an AI person. No one on my board knows. Mm -hmm. Can you give me like five questions to ask them? Yeah. People would just give you the questions to ask them. And then you can pay them too. You could Absolutely. pay them too. Or you can get one of those AI experts and have them come on the pod. And then you can just ask them. That's too. my yeah. secret. By the way, <laughs> since you're already with us, tell me something. Yeah. 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 I think, I think uh, building a network of, of people always makes you um, more, more resourceful and being smart. I'm asking for help, like you said. Yeah. Right? If you're, if you're resourceful, then use that resources that you have. So I think resourceful... Uh, entrepreneurs are more likely to be successful because they have people to ask. They have people to humble entrepreneurs, humble, resourceful yes. entrepreneurs. Yeah. You did the three traits, man: humble, hungry, smart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's good. So. Um, when you jumped into single grain, how did you screw it up at the beginning? Oh man, <laughs> I can talk all day. Um, Sexual harassment lawsuit? No, <laughs> no, no, that's the one thing you didn't do. That's the one that, thing you that didn't do. That would have tanked it immediately. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I, okay, I, we were based in SF. We were in Soma. And um, I was like, "Hey guys, um, we're gonna we're gonna shut down the office." And so, and I, I when I went, what do you in, mean shut down the office? Like, so I was like, "No, we're gonna go remote." Oh. And so, so I, I made these sweeping changes. I'm like, "Okay, so SEO is not working anymore. Let's do content marketing." And then I hired someone that had experience doing content marketing. Um, but the the quote from Reagan is "Trust but verify." I never verified like how the mm. work was going. Right. Um, we did eventually open up another office in Santa Monica. And then I actually read this book called uh, Let My People Go Surfing. So Patagonia, the guy just gave away the whole thing, right? Written by the Patagonia founder. And basically, it's like, yeah, people don't want to be micromanaged. You know, my people go surfing at lunch. I was like, great, let my people go surfing. So I stopped showing up to the office. And so I didn't verify anything. And then, and then like, people were just, like, quitting back and forth. I was hearing, like, people were just, like, coming into work with pajamas. So wait, wait, you, you, you read a guy. Book, wait, wait, you read a book that says just just don't worry about the people. Let I them feel do like there thing. was some, probably a lesson in there. But I think there was probably, like, you took it maybe. to the extreme. Oh, I took it too, ext- I took yeah. it too literally. And also because it felt good, right? Yeah. And so the the book is great. Don't get me wrong. The book yeah. is great. Everyone should read that book. But I was just like, okay, this seems right. And because I had come from remote working before at the previous startup, mm-hmm. I was like, yeah, remote makes sense. Um, and then I came in. Biggest thing I learned was I used to think culture was a bunch of baloney, right? We all know that's not true. It's, it's everything. And I came into the company. I built no rapport with anybody. And in fact, like I was interviewing each person just to see their skill set. But I was like this tech prick, right? And so like- You were bad then. I was bad. I was really bad. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, look, at, at the end of the day, like, I still I still talk to a lot of the people and, like, yeah. we joke, right, about, like, how bad it was back then. Um, but eventually, like, I got lucky. The only reason the company was saved, ironically, was because of SEO. Oh. So, so I, when I joined the company, we were getting, like, 4,000 visits a month to the site, right? Nothing much. And I just, we were doing a ton of guest blogging. Mm-hmm. So, like, what that means is, like, you know, I'd write something on HubSpot and then there'd be a link on the very bottom. Eric Su runs digital marketing mm-hmm. agency, Single Grain. Anchor text, right? So we, we shot up to number one for the word digital marketing agency. And then that's how we started getting like Uber. That's how we started getting like. Oh, to go and do SEO for Uber? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So we started getting a lot of amazing. Uh, I can ask you, yeah. are you guys having problem with the name Uber Suggest getting sued by Uber or something? That's Neil's problem. That's but they Neil's. actually, they I I don't know if I can say this. You can maybe ask Neil when he comes yeah. on this podcast. <laughs> but um, I believe it's, it's, it's worked itself out. So, oh, yeah. He paid them something and it was can't say anything but it's, ah. it's, it's worked itself out All yeah right. we're, we're gonna bring him bring him on a show then. yeah well actually you, you will bring him on the show because the next event uh He's in, in miami okay. is gonna be in january awesome. so yeah. awesome so we should we should do that we should let him know neil patel guys if you guys don't know who neil patel yeah. is then don't even if just you're get what, out of it. if, if you're listening is to going this on. show and you don't know who neil patel yeah. is you have to widen yeah. your should be arrested yeah okay. guys yeah. we're gonna go on, i'm gonna i i demanded that eric and scott are gonna try colada they moved to South Florida and they haven't had colada all this time. This That's from? me. Yeah. Oh, okay. What's oh, the thing nice. on the bottom? Like little berries? Or? Like berries, yeah. All right. Okay. okay. So guys, you're going to go to the colada first before it gets all right, colder. All right, all right, all right. So guys, this is colada. It's Cuban coffee. Okay. And this is, this is one of the Miami coffee iconic... Coffee and liquidity. The coffee coffee and, liquidity. and liquidity. Yeah, we're doing this during okay, the day, cheers. so we're not cheers. doing alcohol. We're not a bunch of drunkies. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's not bad. That's pretty good. I told you. Wow. Okay. You. That's very good. Yes. When anyone comes to Miami, you need to try colada. Wow. Make sure it's going to be done by a place. I actually Cuban like that. Place. This is Otherwise, really good. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. 
It's better than the last coffee we got. Yeah. yeah, well, the last coffee, I think they brought it from uh, a correctional facility or something. They wanted to kill us. So it was bad. But this one is That's great. Good. Yes. Wow, it's great. This is yours? This is yeah. mine. You got a big one? No, this is... This is um, this coffee coffee? This is latte. Mm. Okay. So where were we? Delicious coffee. I can't remember what we're talking about, to be honest. We're talking about Neil. We're talking about the agency. How many? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. About yeah. Uber Suggest. And you said you can say anything, and uh, <laughs> which doesn't sound good. Okay, so Neil, how did you turn it around? <laughs> how did you turn this agency around? So, so obviously, this is like your first time being a founder, CEO, non, non-employee, non pivoted yep. from tech into service. Correct. Um, it sounds like a nightmare, but obviously it wasn't. But yeah. even like, it's so funny because coming from tech... Even when you were talking about the companies that you buy, when you're yeah. talking about buying agencies, yeah. I, the first thing I said, I don't yeah. know, I was like, why yeah. the hell would you do that? Yeah. Like, it was like, why? Yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's this, there's definitely this stigma coming from any, I think, not just tech. I mean, I come from yeah. tech and now I'm in CPG, but the stigma is, why would you worry about such like a, a labor intensive organization? Yeah. It seems like so thing of the past. Like, yeah. you have to have people to do the work. You have to have billable hours. Yeah. Like, it's just a pain. And then... Let me I, come back to that one. That, yeah. that one's really good. So... To, to finish on the, the that's a really good question. So the how we turned it around. So we got number one for digital marketing agency, and we started getting all these leads, right? And we couldn't fulfill the leads because I only had one employee left. Yeah. Um, and so we're <laughs> all the way down to one. And then um, I started referring all the leads out to this other agency in San Diego that's actually valued at like five or six hundred million now. Um, and and we were taking like twenty five percent of the of the lifetime commission, right? So they're just paying us twenty five percent like that. Um, that held us over while I was I was like, okay, we're gonna build a culture, right? And so slowly but surely, like we built it like one person at a time, and then um, hired people that have had been there, done that, are like good at the mm -hmm. work, and then we just started compounding really quickly. And I was like, oh, whoa, we actually have something now. And so it was because of SEO that number one ranking that that kept us afloat, where I could float it with like affiliate commissions. Mm -hmm. And then really bring it all back and just plow everything back into business. If you if you talk to someone that tries to do marketing for their business, they're struggling, and you tell them, look, focus on one thing first. What would be that first thing? Let's just use an agency as an example right now. Okay. Because I, I think it just depends on like your CPG yeah. or if mm -hmm. you're like SaaS or whatever. Um, agency side, I actually know a couple of people last year. Live examples where they had built. Um, seven, eight figure agencies just on the backbone of LinkedIn. And they've just been posting on mm. LinkedIn. Actually, the guy that was at the, the, the dinner that was sitting next to me, um, he built like a 19, $20 million agency um, just by really utilizing LinkedIn. I've seen him all over LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, Chris, Chris, yeah, Chris yeah. Walker. Yeah. yeah, Chris Walker. So he yeah. built like a B2B sales. Yeah. This is the agency. hardest to promote yourself when you're a B2B. When you're, when you're, when you're a wholesaler, yeah. you have to be very creative because if you look, if, if you sell, you mean it's easier for B2B, right? No, not, not for an agent. I'm talking to, for B2B. Yeah. It's very hard to do promotion because you have a very small group of people interested in your product. Mm -hmm. If I sell wholesale shoes, right? You have to have a shoe store. How do I find the people with shoe store? It's just hard because, and I then if you so found different. me, I'm yeah. the exact opposite. No, if you found me as a supplier, yeah. Yeah. you would never promote it. Yeah. Versus if you sell just shoes and you get my shoes, and you like my shoes, then you're going to talk, oh, look at my shoes. You're going to post it on Instagram, right? User generated content. So for agencies, I mean, you just have to be creative. So SEO is great, mm -hmm. right? But but that's just a, a whole different approach where you understand that that person who found out about well, you would never talk well, about Let's you. talk about this. So so there's like the whole concept of media company. So let's put a pin in that one. But I want to come back to Scott's question. Yeah, sure. So your, <laughs> your question was really good, but I forgot it already. No, it was so, just um, why, why would you do you, why product? Would you do oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. there's like so much yeah. labor involved. So, in you know, as I was like reviving the company, I was like, oh, like I'm going to do this SaaS thing, this education, because like it all grows very quickly or like SaaS valuations are amazing, right? Not as amazing and, right now. And, but but <laughs> yeah. pretty good margins are good. Yeah. You don't really have many cogs, really. Yep. So agency, you do have cogs. I mean, you're lucky if your gross profit's like 50, 60% or so. Um, but the great thing about agencies is like, let, let's, at the end of the day, like you don't see like a Gary Vee running the day-to-day -day on the agency. He's not, right? And it's, it's very labor intensive, but if you're north of 5 million in EBITDA, even right now in this, we're recording this as of, I won't give a date. We'll just we'll if, keep it evergreen. Yeah, we'll keep it evergreen. <laughs> um, but like you can get a 15 to 20 X multiple even right now. And, and like it's largely private wow. equity that are buying these agencies and they might buy a chunk. You could take some chips off the table, but that's pretty damn good. If you're like, let's use Neil's as an example. You so, said 15 to 20? 
15 to 20. It's Insane. nuts. On, yeah. On, on and so let's use, um, <laughs> let's use <laughs> Neil's, <laughs> Neil's agency as an example, right? His setup is great because, and he'll, he'll be very public about this. He knows he's terrible with people. Like, I know many people he's made cry. He's not a bad person, but he's just not. He's that kind of, he has a different yeah. personality than, yeah. He's just really direct, right? And very most direct. people can't take that. And yeah. so they're like, hey, you know what, Neil? Just drive traffic. You don't have any direct reports. And then, you know, he just drives traffic. That's what he does. Dharmesh Shah, like from HubSpot, CTO, never had any direct reports. And so that's his setup. And that's a pretty damn good setup, yeah. you know? Yeah. So looking at the the valuations and then look, knowing that maybe you get it a certain size, your playbook is just hiring people that have been there, done that. It's actually not that bad. And the, then we can actually move over to this media company thing because it's like, it's what you're doing, it's what you're doing, yeah. it's what I'm doing. Um, that's how ultimately you, 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 you build this massive audience, right? It just keeps compounding on itself. So like right now, if I look at like the audiences I have, I think monthly we're probably getting like 2.8 million impressions or so, and we're not really paying for it, right? Like this stuff, we're all gonna chop up yeah. and throw in our, our Instagrams, yeah. our YouTubes, so. Um, why not leverage that? So he, 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 my question was more about like a small person that doesn't open an agency. It was more about uh, mom and pop. I'm trying to sell my new coffee out of my garage uh, or, or my, my little jewelry, custom jewelry line. If, if you kind of like had one thing to say, okay, this is how you start. This is how, what would you suggest tactically for them or think a little bit above that with like a small strategy with two or three things that they can do? What would you recommend a person that asks you, Give me a tip. Get, hook me up. What do I do? For a jewelry store. Let's say you have a jewelry store. Okay, mm -hmm. I, you, I, I like using jewelry because jewelry, in terms of a price point, it's very cheap uh, to buy, but mm -hmm. the margin is very high okay. and it's accessible. You go to any conference and you just they have you don't have to go through manufacturing. So yeah. It's an easy business to launch. Okay, so jewelry. I'm gonna go like creative. I'm gonna go practical. So practically, like right now, where you can get the most leverage from the consumer side is like shorts, reels, TikToks, okay. right? So attacking those channels, but also like, what can I do interesting from like an NFT standpoint, right? Like if I want to get really creative, if, if I'm like a very small jewelry store, maybe I want to go big and maybe I want to work with these brands. Cause like Starbucks is getting into NFTs. Like we work with Pete's coffee, right? Like they're all going to do NFTs, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm small, how can I make them a no brainer offer? Read the book, hundred million dollar offers by Alex Ramosi. Great book, 99 cents. Yeah. He didn't pay me to say this, but <laughs> my point is you learn how to create a no brainer offer. And then say, hey, like, we'll do this for you and for free. And then, like, if it goes well, like, let's let's negotiate something, right? And if you look at Tiffany's, they did something with CryptoPunks where, like, I think they sold out, like, a couple million dollars. But that's an example of, like, a high-level collaboration. Um, so how can you take what they did, that the base idea, and then work with, like, a brand that you like, that you're interested in? A smaller brand that, yeah. first of all, Tiffany's and CryptoPunks, they have tons of They're resources. Big. But if you yeah. were a mom-and-pop yeah. jewelry store, brick-and-mortar, even, like, online e-com, I mean, what you're saying is you just copy that strategy mm -hmm. to another smaller brand that yep. obviously doesn't have resources or like yep. the energy to start an NFT project or yep. some sort of trending project without yep. your help, without some sort of like external. Is NFT still a thing, yeah. by the way? I mean, do you still hear people talking about NFT? No, or maybe they have to wait about a year. Everyone's or Everyone's quiet until... now, right? Yes. No, nobody like the NFT space. We can talk about this. It's just such. But a... what's marketing? Marketing is right time, right place. So yeah. at at a, at a certain point yeah. in time, NFTs made a lot of sense to leverage yeah. for marketing. Yeah. Maybe not now. Maybe there's something else that you could do now. Right. Yeah. Well, now you you build while it's a down market, and like you see all the builders building right now. So I I look I I, I don't even think in the future will it'll be a failure in ten years if we're still saying the word NFT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just yeah. another iteration of crypto, DeFi, Web three. Like, what's the yeah. next thing that you want to build that has some sort of blockchain component? Mm -hmm. NFT was the most recent version of that. Yeah. But. You know, I wanted to go back to your point because I actually wanted to argue one of your points. You said that you found consumer sales easier than B two B. So for me, if no, you, a consumer, oh, consumer sales easier than B two B. For B two B, I find so easy because yes. for B two B as a marketer, like I know exactly who my buyer is. I know exactly what their problems are. If I want to target them with like an outbound campaign, I know exactly mm -hmm. who to reach, and like the the order value or the lifetime value of that customer is exceptionally higher. In that case, yeah. you're right because there's also a lot of noise in the market right now for any uh, any retail like, product, yeah. right? Not wholesale. Uh, but but the thing is, for many people, when they said, "Okay, I have a business." Uh, my point, I guess, was uh, I wasn't explaining that well. You see, the, the thing is, when, when you have a product that's amazing, right? If you have an amazing product, much better offered than someone else, you're going to win and it's going to drive itself, right? And if you know some marketing, it's going to just show the awareness over that product and you're good. Because then there's going to be a lot of user-generated content. You can build community. It's very hard to do it when you're doing this 
actually, you can't really do it if you are a wholesaler. I came from that world, right? And people would keep it kind of like in a safe box, maybe giving it to their grandkids. Do not tell anybody that's where I bought this stuff and that's it. They would never talk about you. It's a different and way to market. A, it's and a so, different way to yeah. market. I, I think yes. consumer is way harder. I mean, like, actually, here's what's interesting. I don't know. You, you guys have, have seen like the, the Mr. Beast of the world and like all these super influential guys. So there's like, I don't know if it's TPG or one of these private equity firms, but they're basically trying to back all these like up and coming creators and then just buy like an e-commerce company and just plug it in Yeah. because like the audience is built in already. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's like, it's, that's more valuable than like a, we Facebook had, we had that conversation company. last yeah. night where, where, uh, I said the big brands like, uh, Procter and Gamble, L'Oreal, Unilever, give it 40 years from now, they, they won't be around because, because if you look at today's world, when you look at, Say you mentioned Mr. Beats or, or we look at uh, Kylie. Uh, Kylie and, yeah. Okay, so he had, what is it? The chocolate, number one chocolate in the country as soon as he came up with this yeah. because he has a channel. Then he came up with a burger. First burger didn't come out right, came up with the second burger. There were 100,000 people showing up just mm-hmm. for that, right? And it's just it, people who lived in that area. And then you look at Kylie. All right, a billion dollar makeup brand. Okay, Kim. Clothing brand, three well, billion dollars. Paul brothers Just, are doing Prime. Yeah, that, you, that, it's gonna come a time. Flashing. It's gonna yeah. come a time where they're gonna say, "I don't need your money for investment. I don't need. It is gonna, I don't need you to invest in me because you have, you're nobody for me, mm-hmm. right? I can just do it because there's zero marketing behind me actually yep. selling anything. The second part is there's gonna be a time where major conglomerates would not be able to buy anymore those brands. If you look at It Cosmetics, were purchased by L'Oreal. They were making $168 million. I think it was 2016. They bought them for $1.4 billion. What do you think their EBITDA was on, 1.6, uh, on $168 billion? They obviously bought them for because they thought they were going to keep doubling themselves every time. They're actually going... And that was just one. Then uh, I think uh, about $200 million in sales. Uh, that was for... Uh, it was for Too Faced. They were acquired for $1.4 billion by Estee Lauder. All of them deemed failures long term when you look at uh, Sashedo. And I'm coming from the beauty industry, so I can give you numbers. They acquired um, Bare Minerals for, I think, $700 million. It's a dying brand, right? So all those, uh, all those acquisitions, eventually, it's going to come to a stop because they're going to run out of money mm-hmm. to give them all those high multiples. And the ones that are actually winning, it started with... With guys like, like, like us, understanding marketing, working with influencers, launching our brands, doing amazing. Then it, it continued with influencers launching their own brands. Then it continued with celebrities saying, move aside, everybody, let us. So now if you walk into Sephora, you will watch, watch and see, you're going to see a Kylie. Well, Kylie's not in Sephora. I think she was in Ulta. But you're, you're going to see uh, JLo's brand. You're going to see Selena Gomez's brand. You're going to see the major celebrities' brands first because why would I put anyone else? Okay, I have, I have an I, interesting point, a question on this one. Because now you start seeing celebrities that have never been on social going on social because they feel they have to. So mm-hmm. who's going to win? And it's, I think it's a question of authenticity and connection with your audience. But in my opinion, between celebrities and influencers, I think a celebrity always wins. And I think that's why Mr. Beast has the largest launches of mm-hmm. yeah. this pro- chocolate, burgers, whatever. So I think that even celebrities are becoming, in terms of popularity and like affinity with their audience, almost like a second tier compared mm-hmm. to influencers that have literally grown up with their audience. Yeah. So I think even being a celebrity is not as useful as it used to be. You no. don't have you don't have the like the the barrier to entry to become a celebrity is lower than ever. It's yep. your camera, your you you typing out a newsletter, you going on YouTube. That's the barrier to entry. Andrew Andrew Tate said it well. I think he said on an interview with uh, Patrick but uh, but David he said yeah. there are followers there are followers and there are, um, Super what fans? is it? Well, he said there there are fans and there are followers, right? So ah. some people have followers. And they get a lot of views, but they don't really have actual um, fans. Fans, it's the quality exactly. Of the followers, yeah, yeah, the quality of the followers. So, and I think it's the relevancy. So, if you look at, um, at Mr. Beast, he's my kids love him, right? And they'll buy anything he said, and they know he's making money, and it's okay. They, they agreed. So, I think it's about the person said, "Look, I always like that chocolate, and this I made my own chocolate." There was an, was it him that did the the, the most sour candy or some someone no. else? With someone else that came yeah, up with it. Someone yeah. All they do is they, they gave me that that uh, that candy, that citric uh, candy, because yeah. he was talking about this, right? So in, in what you saw uh, in in the beauty industry, where they noticed all that cash coming in, all those ladies that were celebrities never did any makeup. JLo never did any makeup. Suddenly, three months before they launch a brand, 
Oh, let me start doing my makeup routine. Well, I think that's okay, we all know that now you're going to lunch. But that's yeah. bullshit. It's, it's, not, bu- it's not. No, no, it's, it's, not, so real, it's not relatable, right? It, they know that. So the key thing is you have to stand for something. So yeah. Mr. Beast is like, I want to make the best videos ever. Yes. I'm going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut exactly. a fucking table, whatever. Yeah. Logan Paul, whatever. All these guys, like, it's like Andrew Tate stands for something too. Like, love yes. him or hate him, right? So I, Gary Vee stands for business, right? And that's why, like, there's the agency, but I'll look at all the deal flow. Look at all the cool stuff that he's creating. Yeah. So it's um, going to be. It's going to be. If you have a spiky point of view, like, it's. It's hard to like love someone, I believe. I, I think it's also because you see how they grow up into yeah. it. That's really what makes the difference. You mm-hmm. see, like Gary V has been talking about buying the Jets for like however long. When he actually buys an equity position in the Jet, like people are gonna lose their shit. Yep. That's all he talks about. That's like mm-hmm. the reason why he does what he does. I yep. think like there was like levels to it. Like I'm sure like he wanted to make Wine Library successful and like his dad's business successful yep. and then like make his family comfortable. Like now it's just like yep. buy the Jets. You're I think, I think the, 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 number one, yeah. the, num- the number one example I think everyone can look at it would be uh, Dave Portwine mm. with uh, the pizza reviews. He's been doing this for how many years? Going around all over the country giving pizza reviews it's it's almost like if, if you go to 20 pizza places at least three of them would have him already walking in and and trying to eat their pizza it's just every day he goes to another place doing another pizza review so he came up with his pizza and he has his own line he says one guy ca- uh, one bite everybody knows the rule and that's the name of his pizza he came up with the frozen pizza mm. so it, it obviously people Do you know would, how well that pizza is doing right now by the way I have no idea. I have no idea either. But he he told he said at the time that he was number one in Walmart or something like yeah, that. I'll find out. <laughs> it's a it's a very funny video when he wanted to score his own pizza because he always gives people eight point seven point eight. This is amazing. Seven point eight, but apparently it's a very good score for him. Then he tried his own pizza. Ten. What? <laughs> <laughs> Then he goes and he said, I know you guys don't believe me because you say it's my pizza. So I brought some person off the street. And you see this half naked chick, super hot, which once you start checking her profile, apparently it's his girlfriend. said, <laughs> did I ever see you? She's like, no, okay, try. 10, oh, you see 10? That was it. So yeah, it, it's just a very likable person. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this. I don't know how reputable this news source is, but it says fastest, fast growing bar stool, on pace to, oh, this is just Barstool. Sorry, but the pizza is gonna be in uh, 3,600 Walmarts by the end of the year. So the one bite pizza is gonna be in 3,600 Walmarts. We should talk, did he, did he sell Barstool? I think yes. he did, right? He did sell it to Penn uh, Gambling or something like yeah. that, yes. I, so, uh, that's where They like, bought a channel, they bought a, a media channel. That's where I don't think it, ma- I, I actually think when you think about all the points of leverage, right, there's, you know, capital, media, labor, whatever. I, media, I would argue, is like number one. And then I would say number two is like code. Right, because mm-hmm. if you have the attention at the end of the like, why would you sell if you're continuing to compound the thing? It just doesn't make sense to me. So, <laughs> because like because gambling number. is gambling, I'm just giving yeah. a platform for the old gamble. Maybe my UI it's a little bit better, but it doesn't matter. It's about who's creating awareness better, faster, and cheaper than the competition. Exactly. And they're bo- they're buying a media channel. I'm buying right now CNN and Fox News. I can display ads all the time for free. Mm-hmm. It would cost me nothing, and I can own the the conversation. I can yeah. own the narrative. You're saying like, why else. would they sell? You're asking why would they? Sell? Yeah. Well, why 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 would you sell when you have a, and I talked to people like, actually one guy was thinking about selling his company for a couple hundred million. Right. And I was like, why would you sell? Like it's, it's your what, like, it's a, like, what's the revenue like when he's trying to make the decision? hundred million. He has a hundred million in, re- in annual in, revenue, yes. but not EBITDA, just EBITDA is like 30. Okay. Yeah. And he would sell for a couple hundred, a couple hundred, but, but you know, we, we know this guy already, he's making mm-hmm. like 50, 60, yeah. 70 million a year take home. Mm-hmm. Um, so why would you do that? Right. I get so, it. Well, but, but actually we're talking about the business in that, yeah. that point, but I'm just like, if you have, if you think about it, what, what's Google is a money printing machine. Meta is a money printing machine. They control the attention. Why, if you have something that's continued to compound, Unless you really need the money, why would you why would you sell that? I thing? agree with that. Yeah. Like, do you need so? For example, I, I don't agree with that. I think that there is there is something else to think about. Look, if you're if you're saying, well, I'm making thirty to fifty uh, a year going into my pocket after taxes, especially living in San Fran, you're basically left with twelve, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> I don't right? know the math. Just just do the way. math. Just do the math. Okay, <laughs> do the math behind me. Okay, because it's ordinary income versus capital gain. When I sell. Okay, I only pay the capital gain versus ordinary income, which is much more. But however, all this comes down to two things. One is sometimes you want to do something else yeah. and you don't want to manage so many people. You don't want to have the liability of having a business. It's very easy to remember the sunny days and the cash. 
everyone forget. I, I totally that, so. agree, but let's let's go back to this guy. This guy has his nut already. He's got a yeah. couple hundred million, right? Just don't need the extra crash, right? And he's not tired either, mm -hmm. because this guy is like not really doing that much anyway. Yeah. Yes. So so point is like, and more so, it's not even about the business. It's about the audience. The audience is the point of leverage because like everything's going towards influencers right now, mm -hmm. towards media companies. Again, what we're doing right here is we're building media companies. So I agree with that though. So his point is if you have the audience, if you wanted to start a business in the future, you have this point of leverage that you could launch that product. We were talking about this last night too. So yes. I think there's some cases where your argument has a little bit more of a stronger stance. Like yeah. if it's just a product company and even if you are cash flowing and mm -hmm. you're taking home money, you, I don't think you're charged like, or you're taxed at 70%, maybe you're yeah. charged like 50, you're taxed at 50%. <laughs> but still, if you're, if you want a nice exit and you want to start something new, the thing that you've built will never be, you can't parlay that mm -hmm. into the new thing that you could potentially yeah. build. But, but I, I want to say the, the second point I had, um, the thing is before you sell, you don't realize one thing, okay? And it happened to me and I can tell you it happened to many people. You don't understand how much your image tied to your business. Mm -hmm. You don't realize it because you said, you know what, it's gonna be so nice where I don't have to worry about this. Let me do that one big cashing out and I'll worry about parking the money later. It's gonna be, as soon as that happens and that, that business is taken away and say it's poorly managed and so on, and that was a big piece of your image, it, it does something to you, right? You, you walk into a place, everybody knows you because of that, and you said, okay, how much does your image cost, right? And that's when you said, maybe it wasn't the smartest move, maybe I could have done something else, maybe, 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 be. and then the second part behind this is, a business is an awesome platform to launch anything else. Once you give away that platform and you wanna launch another business, Trust me, it doesn't work the same. You're already comfortable. You don't have to break your back like you were when you were hungry. Now you have to, what do you need to do? You need to have, say, a warehouse. You need to have office space. You need to have a couple employees. Before that, you didn't have to go and do all the Google research. Uh, I don't know, title research. You had everyone it's, doing it's it for you. You can only focus mm -hmm. on the building, yeah. the core. Now you have to do everything else. Yep. So you said, okay, now I don't have that. Okay, so let me build any little tiny shit business so I can have that just so it pay itself. And then if I want to build from there... But this, this is something you think after the fact. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like no one, there's no textbook. Again, if business school would teach you that, but they don't teach you that. So the day after the exit is very important. Yeah. Like everybody have to think about it. I think your exit was a good was good timing though. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. I, I think your exit was exceptionally good timing. Yeah. I mean, that's something where I don't think you would argue that. I would I would never I would never change the outcome. But that's of the hardest else. part of an exit. It's, timing it's anything. Timing yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Momentum. Momentum in anything else you do, right? When, when we're looking at, when I, when I take a, the company, right, Boxy, the one thing we did was we haven't executed everything to perfection, but we have timed everything. Not, not just opening the company at the right time and selling it at the right time. It was mostly about every day of the week, right? There was a timing for everything because you see what happened when there is a tension. It's a supply and demand. If I had to go out and, and launch a new product because my competitor is about to launch something at the same, at a particular month, I wanted to take the attention away, but I didn't have enough time to do it. So I had to create something out of nothing. We have to be very, very creative to launch something, not as good, but just as good, but we can take away the conversation. So we've done this. And we had some execution failures or hiccups, but it was always worth it. And it, it, it doesn't just come in down to the two big days, launching the business and selling the business. It's always within the business itself. You, you look for those waves that you can ride consistently so you can grow all the time. Momentum is everything. And these berries make a big difference in the tea. Would, no. you, ever sell, would you ever sell single grain? Give me a billion dollars, yeah. Um, well, wait, to, wait, to, wait, it's, wait, it's wait, 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 wait. What if it's eight hundred million? Yes. <laughs> okay, wait. Now let's go down. What if it's four hundred million? Yes. Okay, a hundred million. No. Okay. Yeah. Two hundred million. Yeah. Okay. One hundred fifty million. But here, wait, wait, wait. Let's get the number. Th one hundred fifty million. Will you sell it for one hundred fifty million? Yeah, I would. Okay. But, but here's the thing. There's a caveat here. Single grain is not really tied to my audiences, so it becomes a, a different, a different type of calculus. It's just it's the business is on its own. Single grain, good thing the name single grain. It's not like Eric Sue Digital or anything. Oh, true. Yes, so, yeah. yes. So you can. Yeah, yeah but There's they no tell you. They risk. tell you. They tell you. You can no longer do for the next five years anything related. You cannot work with those people. You'll have to basically fi find something else to do. Because when they buy a company, 
One thing you gotta learn, any, any private equity person will tell you, when, when someone buys your company for that amount of money, mm -hmm. they make sure you don't come near because you're a top predator, you're on the top of your food chain. Oh, I'm fine with that. So, so you're never gonna go back to I'm it. Good. So you're okay with that. I'm no good. more yeah. Yeah. marketing, no more agencies. Well, it's not like I'm in the day-to-day -day anyway. So okay, like, yeah, so good. like yeah. That, that key man risk is interesting because that actually, when we're building up a podcast, we're building up a media company, yeah. It's all yeah. key man risk. If that person yeah. isn't involved anymore, yeah. that asset has no or little to no value. Yeah, anymore. this thing's a cash flow machine. One hundred percent. So yeah. how do you how do you manage that, right? If you want to get out of it. Yeah. Well, that's why. I mean, that's the key thing. I, I think like let's use Neil as an example. His company is called MP Digital, right? And so a lot of it's tied to him. And so like if you ever want to get out, it's it's hard. Yeah. You know? The image um, is everything. Yeah. Yes. So. Yeah. I sold I sold the first business. And I remember that the guy told me, look, uh, I need you to do a non-compete for uh, four years. So at that time, I really wanted to get out of it because I was building Boxy. Mm. And he was paying me good, which I was surprised. And I told him, that's, that's not, I can do it. You can write 40 years. I don't really care. <laughs> yeah. I, I do not want to go back to <laughs> business. Mm -hmm. yeah, but then after, after you sign, after you move out, you start seeing the opportunities that he doesn't see in the business because mm. you've been doing it for so long and that's where it, it hunts you at night. It's so, fuck, did I sign for so long? I wanted to I know come. people that exit so and the second their non-competes over, they just build it. Back in, they just yeah. do the I, exact I, same yeah. business again. Yeah. And they, I, I, that's a good call. I never thought, actually, a lot, like 80 to 90% of people I've seen do oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. exit. So I, I consulted with a company. They exited. They sold to a very large company. And then I think it was like a three-year non-compete. And they just build the exact same thing, like, yep. like copy and paste. It yep. was insane to me that they were able to do this. But like the the CEO founder knew what he was doing. He yep. just he just and basically it was kind of um, a situation like I, I don't know what's happened since you sold Boxy, but um, basically he sold his company kind of like you sold Boxy. He saw that after he sold it, it deteriorated. They didn't really do anything with the asset. They kind of like fumbled the bag on it. Yep. And he's like. Fuck it, why not? I'll, yeah. There's a huge market opportunity that I'll just exploit again. And a lot of times they end up buying it back. And they end up buying the dollar. second version. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you a little story. The, um, I, I had a small investment group come into BoxyCharm called Carl Priley. And, uh, you know, they were really amazing. They, they helped me be a better CEO. And that all the way through until we sold. And they always told me stories about companies they invested in. And one of them was a furniture company. This guy had this cabinet company. He was, he was the number one cabinet um, seller for Home Depot. And what he found out is that in Home Depot, there are like 30 different types of cabinets, but 80% of all the cabinets are only two types. So he systemized his entire operation only for those two. Oh. And he was able to be so efficient and cheap and fast than anybody else. And he gave them a better price to Home Depot than anyone else. And he just went on those 80%, right? So this company bought him 500 million and then after they bought him, they said, look, we don't like you as a person. He was a, apparently <laughs> was a personality and they said, get out. So he went and he opened the same exact business, opened the same exact business. The second time one was with Carl Priley. Um, and they were saying that he sold this to the same company who bought him the first time, because what happened when the other company does like a typical acquisition, those are mostly finance people that wanted to do operation. They said, oh, we know how to do it. They go in, they buy you. And they said, look at this guy. He doesn't even know how to do it right. You only did two types of cabinets. Imagine if you do all those 30 no. cabinets. So when they, they went, they bought them, and they fucked it all up. Did 30 cabinets. They weren't efficient. The price went up, blah, blah, blah. He comes in. Again, same scheme. Building it up a couple years into it with them. A whole story. Sell it to them for the same exact price like before. Then Crazy. after he sold, after the, the non-compete, he called them again and said, I'm going to do it again because it's <laughs> and it's the same exact company. Okay, so, so this is a good point. And I want to dive into this because it's something that we've never really spoken about. How do you acquire a company properly? Because we've all been through acquisitions or purchased or sold companies. And my experience, it's the company that acquired mine screwed it up. Mm. I think that you've had a similar, you've had my, some my scenario, well. my scenario. I but wanna, the point yeah. is like, how do you do it right? How do you do it? What's the best way to buy a company and to make it Eric, actually you're succeed? the man, you I, tell us. I, I can speak from my I think you've been the only one that's actually been part of an acquisition where you've actually successfully improved yeah. the companies that you've acquired. Well, I mean, debatable, but. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so, you need the so benefit I'll, of the doubt, man. I'll, 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 I'll just say, look, um, I think for, for us, in the agency world, typically when you're, when you're acquiring a company, like, because it's so like founder driven, you want to keep the founder, right? Which is why like mm. when you buy an agency, typically it's like a three to four year earn out. Mm. Um, and there's a lot tight, like it's half maybe up front and then like the half is paid out later. Um, and then the other thing is ideally they're, they're complementary to, to your, your skill set. Um, 
I think, you know, one of the things for us, I would say one of the mistakes that we made was not doing enough uh, due diligence. And in hindsight, I think what we would have done is um, we, one of the agencies we acquired, like they were much more focused on SMB. We weren't, we were mid market to enterprise. And what we should have done in hindsight is like, oh, we should have just said, oh, let's, um, we should just start like an SMB division to make that all work. But because we're so like focused on the mid market to enterprise, there wasn't exactly like a like. Sorry, a what is SMB? Fit. Small, SMB small business. Yeah, small th business. thank you for the clar clarifying question. So my, my point is, um, one, it's like keeping the founder there if it's like a people intensive business because they're all culture wise they all look up to that founder and and then like holding them for three to four years and that's the same formula with every agency that I've seen even with other M and A transactions. So, so the issue when you acquire a company into a larger company is there's there's almost like a, a negative immune response to that acquisition because the existing, the large company doesn't know how to deal with them. Yep. They don't know how to deal with the types of people that work in a smaller company. They don't know how to deal with the type of customer segment, the type of strategy. So I've spoken to a few people that have solved for this problem um, on, on my show and have solved for successfully. And how you do it is you isolate that acquisition and you let it operate at the same capacity it was operating at. And you don't basically change it or, or, or mm -hmm. let it integrate too much with the larger company. Because when you let it integrate, all the big company problems screw up that mm -hmm. successful small company. So you incubate it so much so that like if you can, if it was a physical office, you literally get them a separate office where they're not day-to-day -day interacting with the other company and you yeah. let them just grow. And that's actually how Apple purchases and incubates and makes sure. Yeah, a, sure. Lot of, a lot of startups. You let them do their thing and yeah. then you integrate. But there's there's actually two here. I'll, I'll go off of two agencies, both doing north of 100 million, uh, both valued around the same. So one agency grew completely organically to the 100 million. The other one grew through acquisition. So you have organic growth versus inorganic growth. And then what happened was the, the inorganic one, so many people problems, right? Because it's like five or six, mm. like they had three or four acquisitions this year, right? And that private equity that was about to buy them pulled out. It's just like, there's the churns higher. Um, and it's just like a hodgepodge of, of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then versus you look at the other one, it's like all organically built, like they're all bought in on the culture and it's like, it's consistent. It's not like a bunch of instability where you're trying to integrate all these things. To your point, yeah, absolutely. You should let them sit on their own. Um, but you kind of, like my mistake was not having the, on one of them, having the, the leader stay, right? The founder, you, you, yeah. You can't have it run on its own without a leader. Well, I think, I think the, a good point. it depends. If you have a company that struggles and it's uh, kind of like a turnover, for, like a restructuring turnover acquisition, that's different. But if you, mm -hmm. if you get a, a, a business that's profitable, oh, that's yeah. standalone, right? The, the biggest thing is that I would say if you over integrate, even if you take one department and say, you know what, let me just move the finance department out. Like, you don't need them. We'll do, we'll do it. You, you, you might disrupt the entire ecosystem because many times uh, one company in, in my, one of my acquisitions can speak to which one. We, we over-integrate too early and we didn't think we were because we said, well, it's just the finance and the logistic. Well, well when you do that, then it, I, I cannot manage the logistic because they don't answer to me or the finance. But in the other business, it was a process driven. So if the logistic has, a, the logistic would say that goes into the box that doesn't. Well, in my company, it wasn't like that. My company was logistic, that's coming late, but still put it in the box, figure it out. It was all about the product. So that's just one example. And then suddenly everything changes in the, the dynamic. The second part, and that probably is the killer for every business, talking culture, our company, one, corporate meeting a week for one hour. Mm. That's it. The other company, God help us. It was from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. all day. Just so you can't go and dump all those and expect people to be productive at 7 p.m. Start doing this stuff. Like No, productivity starts when you wake up until your lunchtime. That's your highest productivity. Let them work until then. You want to have any ex ex couple extra meetings to connect the two? Think very hard what is the most important meeting and add it, but don't just change their lifestyle because I've seen how it, people just quit. That, that's actually a really important point. Not even just from an M&A standpoint, but when it comes to hiring people, people try to like, let's say, I, um, Scott, I joined your company or whatever. Like most people, are like, oh, Eric, go ahead, just start, right? But mm -hmm. most, it's like, no, you actually have to let the person just integrate and sit there and understand how things work before saying, oh, we're gonna change everything, yeah. so. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, overall, like, 
we're not even discussing ego in between, right? When there was a strategic acquisition, one company had their ego because they're competing with the other one. And if there's ego, the, the company will die. Yeah. Regardless. Yes, there's, there's, yeah, we're there's talking like about, we're talking about a company that has no ego. They're just trying to be there's successful. There's always going to be mm-hmm. something if it's, it has something because you're talking human beings. It's not zeros right. and ones, right? So just being kind of like aware of that, say, look, now you have to change that. You have to work together. And it's not, it's not for everyone. Not everybody gets it uh, the same way. No, that's smart. Um, we haven't even spoken about any actual tactical marketing things. Yeah. Every, seriously. What do you sure. think you're both um, over? So you've gone through the gamut like over your career. I mean, you've, you've dabbled in pretty much every kind of marketing. Yeah. Um, what would you say is the, the highest point of leverage for a marketer now? Is it just pure going organic social? Like, do you still see a ton of value in SEO? Do you still have to focus on everything? Or as an early stage marketer, you just find one channel that just kicks ass and you just double down and exploit that channel. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it's interesting. I, I did, um, so I have this founders community. We, the, the, the main topic a couple of weeks ago was like everyone's, how everyone's building this, this, um, these media companies, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, going hard on YouTube, going hard on LinkedIn, going hard everywhere where there's a strong organic reach. And so I've talked about this on marketing school before where if, if I were to start from scratch and my background's in SEO, by the way, and then I, I, I branched out. I would not start with SEO. Mm -hmm. Um, I would start where, if I'm B2B, I go LinkedIn first. If I'm B2C, I go the things I talked about, shorts, reels, um, the TikToks. And then I would nail one channel and then work on scaling because like this that we're doing right now, we- we, This is SEO. This is this is a pillar piece of content. Yeah. And we can chop this. This piece can become sixty pieces of content. Mm-hmm. Um, every marketing school episode, it's a daily marketing podcast, can become a long for fifteen hundred to two thousand word post, and that can go on LinkedIn as well. And so I I was just mentioning earlier, like when I title, when I when I tally my my monthly reach, it's about two point eight million impressions, and. On our site, like, you know, we're getting like, sure, like 150, 200,000 visits a month, but SEO has gotten a lot harder, um, especially for B2B, and it's going to continue to get harder. I think if you're lucky enough to have um, maybe some dollars sitting around, you can go buy some sites that are monetized by AdSense, and you can buy their domain authority. Hopefully they have an email list, mm-hmm. and then like layered on with what you have. So. Yeah, I think, I think also when you do or social media well. Mm-hmm. This is basically doing SEO. I think the, and I've seen this. When it I, it, it's, it's literally, you can look at Google Trend. If you trend on social media, you jump on Google Trend and you're going to see the spike by the hour, by the hour. And then Google's algorithm is not working on links anymore because they understand that all the chatter is on social media. People yeah. don't link like before. Yeah. So they said, well, just do social media. That will do your SEO. When I, um, when I hired uh, this guy, it was a nice guy, but I told him, look, I want you to do some marketing, figure out some growth hacking strategies. I don't know if, you know, it was good or not, but it went right SEO. I said, I don't need you to do SEO. Like, that's, that's 2008. Yeah. That's done. That's there's just something else. Yeah. Well, um, one thing I'll add too is, is this, this podcast that we're doing right now, when I look at retention rates on Apple podcasts, it's like 80 to 90% on like a five minute episode. But if you go to YouTube, the retention rate's like 40 to 50%. So hmm. if we want to build relationships at scale, like depth, then like really? nothing's better than this. And it's like, okay, the hardest thing to grow is a podcast from what I've seen. It's like, okay, how do you get on other podcasts? How do you advertise on other podcasts? Or we actually trade impressions with um, like Jordan Harbinger, for example. He gets 6 million downloads a month. Marketing school, we're at like 2 million. So we're like, hey, why don't we trade you 500,000 impressions a month? You trade us and then like let's swap mm-hmm. and see how yeah. it goes. I mean, same thing with growing an email list or whatever. It's just whatever's native makes a lot of sense, but people don't think like that. So. This is the difference between followers and actual uh, fans. Fans, yes, that, that's going to be the difference. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's why. I think that's why your CPMs and 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 your cost per mills and what you can actually charge for an advertisement on a podcast is mm-hmm. so much more than what you could charge for uh, a sponsored in feed Instagram post. Yep. That actually, in current day's yeah. algorithm, nobody will actually see unless it's real. Yeah. But um, like, I think that that's why if you have 60 minute, well, I mean, you do, actually, I also want to figure out why you do shorter versus longer. Mine are like 45 to 60 minutes. Mm-hmm. This is obviously longer yeah, than yeah. an hour. We, yeah. But if you have somebody who has like an 80% retention on like an hour plus long podcast mm-hmm. episode, your voice is in their ear for yeah. like an hour plus of their day. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. There's a, a massive amount of trust that's built with that 60 minutes. And they do it every yeah. single week. Like, I, I wouldn't listen to myself like that much. <laughs> And so, like, if somebody does, like, that's very impressive. And you can sell yeah. anything to that person. Well, to, to your point, I mean, um, when I when I talk to the single grain team, it's like anybody that's listened to the podcast, the sales cycles are shorter. And yeah. then the LTV of the customer is a lot higher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so 
But why, why short form a podcast? Oh, so so okay. why do you do five minute shows? Well, I do both. So, okay. with, oh. with, so I have three podcasts. One's called Marketing School. That one's five minutes daily. And then uh, Leveling Up, that one's like more longer form, like 45 to 60 minutes, entrepreneurial ones. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm like, okay, how do I open a pod? We were talking about this. How do I open a podcast studio where we go for two to three hours? Yeah. Right? So that one I want to go long form. And then I have one called Creators of Web 3. That one's like short form too. Um, it just, I think it just depends on what for each. Do you notice, have you like actually looked at the numbers? If you don't, that, that's cool. But if you looked at the numbers and see like between a five minute show and a 45 minute show, and I guess you haven't really launched like a, Joe Rogan style three mm-hmm. hour show, but in the five minute and the, and the 45 to 60 minute, that's still a very different product you're putting out. Yep. Do you know which one resonates more, which one has customers that convert at higher rate? So I will say, I, I can respond to the second one, uh, for leveling up, which is a longer form one, they actually say they like that one more than marketing school. Because for marketing school, sometimes like the way we record on that one is like, Neil and I will get together, it's a one hour recording session, we, we crank out 10 episodes, mm-hmm. and we're just winging it, yeah. right? And so sometimes you get some gems, sometimes it's like, mm-hmm. what are you guys talking about? <laughs> and so, but like, that's how that so one So it's works. the quality of the content, not necessarily the length. Yeah, it's, it's depth versus, I think, um, okay. breadth. How yeah. many people do you, how do, how do you do the leveling up? Is it just you and Neil or? Leveling up is just me. Okay. So like, I just get, like, whenever I do interviews, like, I just get curious and I, I just want to learn on those. And yeah. so I get a lot more value from those. And so does the, and like, if you look at um, leveling up, it's like 4.9 stars. And then you look at marketing school, it's at like 4.7 now. Mm. And like, it, it's slowly, you know, <laughs> yeah. 4.6. Yeah. yeah. But how, how, how was um, growing uh, marketing school versus leveling up? Which one yeah. is easier to grow? Well, marketing school, we kind of cheated because like Neil's got a big email list and my email list has like, uh, I don't know, 70, 80,000 or so. He's got like four or 500,000. Um, so when we started it initially, he pushed the email list. I pushed my email list for the first three months and then we're just off into the races. Um, it's and, not cheating. It's just using, well, I, the ads, using yeah. your own audiences. Yeah. 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 But I, it's just hard for people to replicate that one. But mm-hmm. I will say the daily thing helped a lot um, because most people just weren't doing daily. So well, that's what that's so. Um, that's Entrepreneurs on Fire by yeah. John Lee Dumas. He yep. does he does daily, mm-hmm. which is interesting to me. I don't, I I I don't know. I don't have like a, a strong status to whether or not like a lower not lower produced, but technically he doesn't do video. Yeah. Like, would you rather do a once a week video audio? In my opinion, that yeah. I gravitate towards that once a week video audio, tons of reels, tons yeah. of clips, go on YouTube, second largest search engine in the world. Yeah. Um, that's the way that I like to create content versus. I think marketing school's video, but JLD is just audio. I think it's bit. harder. So like um, a, a JLD or even like, um, I remember I used to listen to Nathan Latka's podcast. The, the I don't know one. that podcast. Yeah. So he, um, he's interesting. So he <laughs> basically like, you can tell when you do like a 15 minute interview, they're just trying to get through it. You can feel mm. that they're just trying to get through yeah. it. Like interesting. I, I was on, um, so you're in a machine. Almost. Yeah. I was on John Lee Dumas. So I was like, oh, he's just like, he, it's great, but I can tell he's trying to get to the next one. Cause he's doing like seven or eight or even 14 in a day. Yeah. And wow. That's his day, you know? Yeah. Wow. And he has a formula and, yeah. and it's, and it's not, not to say it's like scripted, but it's like you have the confines of, of what he wants to bring out and yeah. he'll hit this point with every single person and the next point. And to me, you know, what's funny. Like I always advise creators, if you're going to create something, do something you enjoy. Mm-hmm. So I actually don't believe you should, you should slot yourself into a box day one. Yeah. I think that if you want to be a successful creator, you have to do it for five to 10 years. So do something you enjoy, create a medium that you enjoy, and I almost guarantee you will find some sort of tribe along the way, as long as you're listening to this feedback loop of the people yeah, that you, you do. You can't, you can't start to dread it. That's the main thing. That's like, the issue When that I started um, the leveling up one, it used to be called Growth Everywhere. I actually followed, a, I've been doing that for 10 years. So it started with the formula first. And then, you started a podcast 10 years ago? Yeah, so before oh Tim Ferriss, yeah. And so like I started with a formula and then I was like, okay, now it's evolved more into like a conversation like this. Yeah. This is more enjoyable for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, so. yeah that was the thing when, um, when I decided I want to launch a podcast. And I spoke about this with Scott. Scott told me all the si- all the reasons why he has a podcast. Mm-hmm. And for me, I wasn't sure why. I just knew that it's it. I have the time, mm-hmm. and if I'm gonna station it where I have it already, before I launch my next big thing, mm-hmm. I'll be able to actually have a podcast forever. Versus if I already have a business and then go and do a podcast, my mind is not gonna be in it. Yeah. And I figure I'm gonna do it now because I I generally enjoy this and. Um, and then everything else came back. I, I guess uh, when you have a media channel of your own, that's when you're going to be more successful. Oops, there's a, yeah, we have the 12 <laughs> or 12.30. That's when the shades are going down. Let's move those. 
I definitely need to tell them we don't need to put those shades on the system anymore. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the, uh, my studio. I mean, it, I don't know, man. It, it's it's leverage at the end of the day. I um the the podcast is the most valuable. It's again, it's the hardest thing to grow, and I'm just like. Nothing's more valuable than... Oh, also, like, I think about YouTube. So, mm -hmm. because discoverability is so hard on podcasting, and we've talked about this, like, pre-show, um, I look at my YouTube now, the algorithm's changing so much where it favors smaller channels, mm. and the My First Million podcast, they get a million downloads a month on the pod, but on YouTube, they get 3.5 million views a month. And so it's like... They're at 3.5 million? Yes. Damn, and I so didn't know like, that. It's like, how do we push the hell out of this? You know? They actually, they've grown very quick on yeah. on YouTube as well. Yeah. They've gone from like zero to, I think it's like seven or 80,000 subs. In, yeah. And, and, yeah. And this goes on like the whole like, everyone could do this, right? You go on Upwork and there's a bunch of amazing people that would charge like $10, $15 an hour that are actually really good at like real shorts and all that. And you just test them and you just hire an army of these people to like take your one piece of content into like 60 pieces of content. Yeah. Oh, well. so. Yeah. I mean, look. I mean, it's content is king. Uh, back then, we used to do. I mean, I think you were also doing the same thing when Reddit dig stumble upon. Oh yeah. yeah. And if, if I, you I was well, never on, I was never into that. That was early. I, I observed. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. so back then, before social media was the social media that we know today, it was all uh, kind of like social bookmarks. And we the idea was especially for someone that does SEO, if you wanted to get a million links on a million like lots of them, you want to hit the front page. Yeah. On dig or Reddit. Yeah. or stumble upon because that's when the bunch of sites that have, had their RSS feed linked to whatever hits the, the front page. Mm -hmm. And also you said, well, I can make it into CNN, but I can make it into the dig front page. Yep. And uh, the authority for that page was a thing. So we were going in trying to beat the algorithm yep. all the time. It just, and now it's social. And now you have to actually just do a good job. Like yes. Yeah, now yeah that's the biggest pain in social. But even then, my <laughs> point is, I mean, actually to close this, <laughs> yeah. the, the point was, at first, it was easy to hit the front page. Then you had to actually have good content because it would be kicked out of the front page instantly. Mm -hmm. And we, 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 that's when I started using the term. I, I, I'm using it from someone else. Content is king. So if you get the right content, it's going to work. Now, for us, if you look at what happened with Barstool with the um, acquisition, they bought it because it's a media channel. If you build a media channel, eventually it's going to pay off, right? It's going to pay off because you have your own TV, you have your own audience, you can launch on it, new products, mm -hmm. you can do everything you want. And we had a conversation yesterday. How do you get to be a $100 million podcast? You probably can't, especially now the pro proliferation, tons of, but you can plug in products, you can plug in other things that can reach a hundred million plus in sales through a podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that if you, I think the point about media channel is very important. You look at, and it doesn't always have to be podcast either. So I think that that's a take home lesson for creators. You build the thing that you like to build. You like to be on camera, you record a video. You like to write, write. Look at Morning Brew. Mm -hmm. Like they were required for whatever, just under 100 million, I think, by yeah. Inc., if I'm not mistaken. No, by um, Axel Springer. Axel Bus Springer. Business Insider. Oh, Business Insider. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. getting my outlets. Yeah. But yeah, so that was just people writing a lot two college kids writing and then they obviously scale up the writing team but over time they had whatever x million yep. subs on and they sold that for i think it was 70 70 yeah yeah 70 so million dollars hustle too hustle yeah. sam Parr, yeah. uh, it, uh day one it was just him writing a daily newsletter mm -hmm. and then he hired out more writers and yeah. they still did the daily newsletter then he productized it he had a monthly subscription mm -hmm. product he sold it to a uh, hubspot and like obviously yeah. not public numbers but uh, like between 20 to 30. I, I think it's smart for for them because like they they wanted the nut to feel safe and then work on the next thing so i, yeah. I think there's no like clear answer of whether you should sell or not like we're not saying that here, no but so. but, but yeah. the creator economy is amazing but uh -huh. i think that people just get caught up in like what everyone else is doing whereas you can make for example 20 to 30 million dollars writing still yes. If yeah. you want to do that, yeah. I mean, look at look at Substack publications that are monetized. I'm sure some of the biggest ones have several thousand, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue coming in through monthly subscriptions. Dude, do you guys know this uh, Stephen Bartlett guy? Have you heard of him? I, I've Diary of a CEO. Yeah, so yeah. I started watching him like last Who is week. He? So he he's like a, he's an English podcaster. He he built this huge social media company. He's on yeah. like English. Uh, UK Dragons Den, I think. Yeah, or? so he's he's all those, and so I started following him like last week. I started watching his stuff, and basically in the last year or so, he's grown his podcast from nothing to like ten million downloads a month or whatever. And he just has really cool, interesting people come on. He just has conversations, right? Yeah. And then he has all these brand deals and all that. I, I think a year ago, um, he was doing like one point two, one point five million a year or so on, on just like the advertising. I'm sure it's a lot more now, um, but I, I'm just saying like that reinforces what we're talking about with depth and I recommend what do you think it's going to do to regular traditional media 
Well, I think that the trust value with a podcaster, if you've seen, like, I, we don't have to guess. You look at the the affinity uh, and the trust factor. I don't know how, even know how you measure that, but mm -hmm. with Joe Rogan, like he's watched more and and with certain audiences trusted more than mainstream media. But money so, wise, what do you think money wise? Do you think eventually all that monetization will flow is, over? Is going to basically take a bigger chunk from regular TV? Oh yeah, I think it'll take a big. I think it's wherever the attention is. That's marketing one on one. And like, here, here's a reinforcement for you guys. We're all busy. We're yeah. sitting here right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. right. So, that's, that's so right. why are we doing this? It's, we see value in it, mm -hmm. right? Now, I think that there's, I think that there's so much money that I don't know if it would actually take money away from traditional media yeah. because I think that unless you see media ratings dip and, and eyeballs on traditional media dipping, then yes, that'll correlate with lower ad aren't, budgets. Aren't they dipping already? I don't think TV dies because I have YouTube TV. I still like watch TV every now and then. So Yeah, yeah but yeah. YouTube is not traditional. Well, YouTube TV is kind of, it's like cable TV basically. It's, it's more like Netflix. It, no, it, you, so YouTube TV is just like when I watch football and all that, I just oh, go to really? YouTube TV and I pay $65 a month or whatever. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think wherever the attention is, the money will go. So there will always yeah. be more money for. Yeah. 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 I think the the reason you don't see that many podcasters, it's because it takes a little bit more execution wise. Because it's an indie venture. Podcast, it's yes. something that you have to start on your own yeah. more often than not. Yeah. It's very difficult to scale. There's no organic reach. It's highly demotivating when you put something out into the world and five people see it yeah. versus somebody who puts a, like a TikTok video out and can hit a million. Yeah. yeah. You can just go eyeballs. viral all of a sudden with your podcast. It doesn't but, really but work like the this. Thing, the thing with, with TikTok is like, I remember there's like um, these these creator conferences and like TikTokers that have like 20 million followers, they can't even fill a room. Whereas like mm. the podcasters, they again, they have that 100%. depth. So you actually have, oh, wow. so if you look yeah. at, so it's interesting if you actually um, look at the quality of a subscriber or a follower on every platform, mm -hmm. it's like podcasting and YouTubing. Uh, YouTube is probably like the top. Mm -hmm. And then... I'm sure it's like LinkedIn, Twitter, yeah. uh, Instagram. They sort of like circle as like second tier. And then yeah. like TikTok is bottom of the barrel. Yeah. You can have somebody with like literally millions of subscribers or followers on TikTok and they have nothing anywhere else. Mm -hmm. But if you have somebody with millions of subscribers on YouTube, you'll notice all the other socials have tons of subscribers. Yeah. When I when I was trying to push products, um, make a product, I noticed that it was easy. It was before TikTok. If, if we wanted to push color cosmetics like an eyeshadow, no problem. Instagram is just great because it's instant gratification. You see the shade, you see whatever it is, you swatch it on the hand, it's good. But if you wanted to push a skincare, there's no in immediate transformation, right? You have to use it for mm -hmm. a while. It had to be not just on YouTube. It had to be the right YouTubers that have actual listeners mm -hmm. that follow them for what they buy. And they would say, well, you know, my skincare problem, it's the only thing that helped me. I've been using it for three months. They had to really speak and explain. And that was the only thing that helped. And it was challenging because, because it, was, it was mostly that we, we couldn't really promote everything the way the brand wanted us. They said, well, can you push it on Instagram more? I said, yeah, I can, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. This is the channel. Every, every channel works different. Obviously, if it was the same YouTuber could sell anything that uh, an Instagrammer would sell, right? But they could, it wasn't going the other way around. There was much more work for YouTube. Also, to, to your point, um, actually, I mean, I, think about this. I, I actually ran a poll like a month ago. I was like, hey, which, for, which channel has the most valuable followers, right? Is it YouTube? Is it Twitter? Is it LinkedIn? Whatever. Um, is it, I think I said, I, I forgot the other one, but by f far, it was YouTube. Like everyone's just saying YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like what, what's going to be out there in 10 years? Like what has the most, I guess, potential for like, 100, 100 years down the road, it, yeah. it is YouTube, right? Because it compounds their discoverability. So I also think that there's like the psychological component of seeing somebody, like seeing somebody, like how do you build a relationship, right? Like, well, the best way to do that is to sit down with somebody, you know, yeah. grab dinner, shake their hand. But the second best way you're going to do that remote and mm -hmm. virtually is mm -hmm. seeing their face on camera, yeah. which is, that's like, that's how you build a huge, scalable, mm -hmm. leverageable audience. You can't mm -hmm. do that, obviously, by shaking every fan's hand, but you can do that on YouTube to an extent that's way more meaningful than mm -hmm. even a short video on Reels, yeah. TikTok, uh, way more meaningful than 240 characters on Twitter mm -hmm. by far, right? So I think that's probably why that's probably why it has like the the most valuable audience. Yeah, I, I think this is the, this is interesting because like this is what like an hour or two hour conversation, and then you, you can just again go on Upwork, hire an army of people, and then boom, like you have like this becomes like thirty or forty. Well, that's what I do. So so yeah. for my yeah. podcast, and we're starting to build up, like the infrastructure for for this show as well. Yeah. But for my show, it's like we record for an hour, hour and a half, yeah. and then that is RSS feed plus YouTube. 
uh, I use otter.ai to transcribe it. Then I pass it over to a copywriter so they don't have to do tons of work listening to it. They turn yeah. that into a newsletter, yeah. put that new, send that newsletter to my community, put that up on my website as well. And I mm -hmm. put that newsletter like five different places. Yep. And then of course, then you have all the video content, like you said, and that mm -hmm. just goes into 50, 60 different social clips. Yep. And it's like a super, for, for a solopreneur, this would be like a super scalable content strategy with yep. this pillar content. That's why I love yeah, that's, it. That's, that, that's a great formula. And I think the, the fact that when, when, you, when you look at Instagram, you know that people are not going to necessarily go and listen to you for an hour and a half, two hours. Mm -hmm. But it does give some awareness. And there's going to be a little bit of them start following your page. And then a little bit of them eventually would come in. YouTube, on the other hand, if they listen to you over there, they'll stick around or they'll actually download your mm -hmm. podcast because they're going to be more dedicated once yeah. they listen to your... And then let's talk about the other benefits. I mean, the... the Think about the deal flow. Like any company that I found interesting, I don't know if you've done this, but it's like I'm gonna get him on the pod. And right after we go to the the hundred percent, hey, like, um, can I write a check? Yeah, so, yeah. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's actually. I mean, <laughs> so like I always cherry pick guests based on what I'm trying to accomplish. So yeah. like if I'm like trying to raise money, I'll like I'll yeah. find somebody that's like actively investing, or if yeah. I'm trying to learn about something, or just get a. Anytime I bring on a guest, like sometimes they're just huge guests, so I want to bring yeah. them on. But sometimes if they're like a business guest, I'm like, why do I want to bring this person into my life right now? What do I want to talk to them about? Yeah. And it's like, it, this is me without actually having a product to sell. Like yeah. I don't have an agency, but imagine if you were a business leader, you start a B2B podcast, you make sure the content in the podcast is basically answering questions that your your ICP, your ideal customer profile is would be asking for your product or service. And then not only can you take all the derivatives of that content and use it for B2B marketing material, and you, mm. again, you blast it out across all your social channels, but also you have an hour plus with this like decision maker, decision influencer, stakeholder, that you're sitting down with talking about things that you're both passionate about building a relationship with, like you don't usually get that access. Yep. So that could be VP sales, that could be CEO, that could mm -hmm. be CMO, it doesn't matter, but you have this hour long segment that just like build rapport with that person. Yep. That's yep. way underutilized. Sometimes, sometimes it's, it's like you can have a very important guest that doesn't know how to articulate themselves. Mm. The question is, how do you get that information? Because they can give very valuable information versus someone that articulates himself very good, but he's not really saying much. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of like a business world where you said, well, I have a couple employees, one of them is great. They can go and put out um, a PowerPoint presentation. They'll convince everyone, but what they want to do is not the right thing versus the person that doesn't really know how to present himself. They'll write it on a piece of napkin, but those are the ones that you want to listen to, the mavericks. So how do you get to find, okay, he might be challenged, challenging speaking to him, but this is the kind of guy that knows how to get stuff. It's actually that on the host. So the host has to do the research. So like, like, let's say it's a 30 minute interview, maybe you're four xing the amount of time that you do research and mm -hmm. you're guiding the conversation. Cause if you're not prepared, you're not gonna know the right questions to ask, which right. means it's gonna be a poor interview. And Scott, you know that too. Um, and it also depends on the guest. So I have a very candid conversation with the guest ahead of time. I'll say like, listen, I don't usually script stuff. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna get a good interview, mm -hmm. What do you want to ask the person? You want to ask the person something they're most passionate about. Yep. So when somebody's passionate about Always. something, they're just going to talk about it. They're going to love talking about it. So mm -hmm. when they're like, hey, Scott, what do you want to talk about? I'm like, listen, what do you care about? If yep. that's a valid point that's useful for my audience, let's dive into that. I don't care if you've written like five different books and worked for four different companies. Like, what do you actually give a shit about right now? Because mm -hmm. first of all, you have these great talking points and you have this flow because you've done probably like 20 other of these interviews. So I know you're going to bring tons of value. You're not going to be like, um, ah, uh, like I don't, mm -hmm. you know, like, second guessing what you're what you're saying but also um you're going to feel more comfortable because something that's just like recent in your memory and then if you want to i don't usually do this but if you really want to uh depending on the personality of the person i will script out questions ahead of time if they feel that's the best way for them to bring value to the podcast but that's a that's a candid conversation you have yeah. with the guest so it depends on the style of the show but if the show is meant to be educational and you want to bring stuff out of that person you just find a way to tap into what they're most passionate about, or you give them the opportunity to sit, to think through their points ahead of time. Yeah. And that doesn't really happen often. I mean, the person that's less media trained and does like less general public appearances, podcasts, talking segments, whatever, maybe they're a little bit more uh, apprehensive about just winging it. Um, so then that's the option you get for that person. But then you get an awesome show and, and the audience doesn't really know either way. A well-spoken, like media trained or just charismatic individual that just can riff off points versus somebody that had to prep 20 questions ahead of time, it's the same valuable content. So ultimately it's just about setting the, you set yourself up for success. So it's yep. totally on the host. I wanna come back to, to one thing. Um, you, 
we talk about starting a podcast, right? So sh- sure, you can do discoverability on, on shorts, YouTube, whatever. But when I started 10 years ago, um, it was really demotivating, right? That the first, I was spending six hours a week on this while I was trying to save single room, by the way. So like I'd reach out to the people, I'd, I'd prep, and then I'd write the show notes myself. I'd publish it, schedule it to go to WordPress and all that. Yeah. And, and, and what I have to show for it after the first year? It's getting nine downloads a day, right? <laughs> and, then, and then the second See, year- We're not doing that bad. <laughs> sec- second year, I keep pushing, right? Oh, 30 downloads a day. And then so like, but so why do you continue to go? It's like really one of the points you were making. You're passionate is, about that. It's your rate of learning. Like yeah. how much are you learning from this person? Uh, but also you're looking for the unsolicited response rate, meaning that every now and then there's going to be a comment. I don't know why this isn't getting more views. This is amazing. This changed my life. And yeah. that's what keeps you going. But it's first the rate of learning, the unsolicited response rate. Forget about the views because you're going to kill yourself. Notice, notice that yeah. all, all, all that conversation is never about money, Mm-mm. right? It's about the views, how many listen, how much influence I get, how much I learn. Because mm-hmm. if you want to build a business and at first we all want to do it for the money, but once you're actually in it, it's for the journey. Because if you're yeah. about the money, yeah. then you're going to die. I don't know on a single creator that's day, ever become first a creator day, for the money. It doesn't yeah. work, yeah. yeah doesn't I, work. I mean, we're, we're near Miami, right? We're, we're, it's a very money-driven place, right? Yeah. But, like, yeah. it just, that's not, it's very, like, nobody wants to make money short-term, but, like, I, everyone wants to make money short-term, sorry. But, like, long-term is, like, always the answer. <laughs> long-term is always the answer. And if you want to make money short-term, it's not going to be with content. It's not content can be a top, content can be top of funnel for a product you're serve, uh, you're selling, but ultimately if you want to just monetize an audience, that's a long term play. Mm-hmm. But it, again, it's like this hugely leverageable asset. Like it can there's no there's no end of life on a on an audience. You can build that for the next 50, 60 years if you want to. Yep. And actually, I'm curious if you have any ideas of who's who's still doing that well because I don't think we have a ton of creators that have been around for that long, but I'd be curious to see who's done that over like basically the longest period of time that in modern history that has built an audience, maintained it, and stayed relevant. Tim oh. Ferriss? Tim Ferriss is probably one of yeah. the best examples. Joe Rogan actually started really early too. He's like, what, like 15 years ago now? You're talking yeah. podcast, but think about No, anything. Just, any okay, creator, so yeah. any creator Kardashians, just, 20 years relevancy. I don't yeah. know how long, 20 years. How do you stay yeah. relevant? So relevant, the most relevant. So Tim Ferriss is For, a good yeah. example. Yeah. Tim Ferriss, he did like his four hour work week or whatever and he... Uh, well, Tim Ferriss started in a world when there was no one there. Now he's he has his first mover advantage, right? But what I'm saying is, how did the Kardashians stay relevant for over well, it, 15 it's, years? It's like Gary Vee, you're just following the their relevant. life. You're just yeah. following their life. Yeah. yeah, it's just entertaining. That's what it is. That is what it is. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have to... Um, let's... Uh, there was one more thing that I want to go into, which is really what you wrote your book about. And Mm. I don't know if you know much about uh, Eric's book, but he wrote a book basically based on like comparing and drawing analogies from video games uh, to leveling up in your life, Mm -hmm. which I thought was like a really interesting concept. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe just speak a little bit about that and just some lessons for the audience uh, and why you look at life this way, like a video game, because that really hits home with me. Yeah. Um, But the the concept of leveling up, um, why did you tie it back to like gaming? And how does that apply to someone's life? And how can they sort of level themselves up very similar to how they would level themselves up if they're playing a video game? I mean, dude, business is the ultimate game. I mean, this that we're playing right now, this is a game in itself. We're, we're playing the game of social. We're trying to, you know, build yeah. our audiences and all that. And so for me, like, everyone has their thing growing up. Like, a lot of people understand sports. They understand football. But that stuff was, like, not a big thing maybe 100, 200 years ago. Um, and so this is just a modern version of sports. You have a lot of people playing. The problem with, with gaming or sports is that you can overtrain, right? So you can tear your ACL, you know, if you overtrain. But with gaming, you can totally screw your mind up. Like, I remember I used to go to, like, Carl's Jr. at 6 in the morning, eat chili ch- cheeseburger and, like, chili cheese fries and get a Diet Coke to keep the fat off. But, and then go back to playing World of Warcraft or go back to playing poker. It's, like, really unhealthy stuff, right? But, like, I've learned how I play business better because I've learned a lot playing poker. You learn how to manage your emotions. You learn how to deal with people long term. Your bankroll management. All that stuff factors in. You learn how to invest for the long term. And so... All those traits flow into business, and business is the ultimate game. Relationships are a game. Everything's a game. And when you look at it that way, everything's just more fun. So, I mean, we're doing this because we're having fun. We're trying to have fun, right? It's not because yeah. we, we need it. Yeah, they're saying, um, it's on my line, uh, so business is a video game, and the money is just a way to keep score. Yeah. 
It is. You can start taking some of these quotes if you want. No one's going to. Yeah. You, sh- you should just say, you know, you just say Joseph it. Martin. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. Um, do you find that uh, entrepreneurs have the wrong view when they start? Work? Like you work with a whole bunch of entrepreneurs. I'm sure a lot of people reach out to you. I saw your, your post the other day about people trying to get you to go for coffee and shit. Oh, yeah. So, but the point is <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when entrepreneurs reach out, like what's, what's the, what's the biggest mistake that a young entrepreneur makes when they're starting to build anything? It could be a service product. It could be building a brand. And what's yeah. the number one thing they always screw up? I mean, nobody wants to wait. Everyone wants to get rich tomorrow. And so, and you learn like the most important things is just like, it's going to take you decades to build something great. And most people just like, they can't help themselves. They can't, they compare their chapter one to someone else's chapter 40. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so like we've learned over, and I think we're all like that younger when we're younger. It's like, oh no, like, you know, we need to get this Lambo. Like it's all like the wrong thinking. You, you tend to like just it's a lot of envy yeah. and then you realize, no, like it's what it's about is again, learning and then maybe teaching, paying it forward and then just continuing to compound. Um, I mean, Warren Buffett's the best example. He just continues to compound over time. There's no like just, you know, easy, you know, steady as she goes. And that's how everybody has won. And so. do you think that it's um, like a learned, a learned skill set that patience and, or is that just something that's ingrained in you? Like it's like a personality No, I, I think you learn it. Like my opinion is I, I think you learn you it. You didn't, cause you didn't go back. You modify, you modify. You, yeah. you, were, you were in single grain, yeah. it was not going well. Yeah. You could have said, fuck this and yeah. gone and worked for somebody. Yeah. Well, but I think with single grain, what you had is an evolution as an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. And, as a person And, and you needed that, that early failure, right? Yeah. Kind of like an immunization where in, in many cases, what happened was you came into a business that perhaps was overly structured and then you needed to start all over again to figure out what you do and then learn how to restructure the business. Because one reason many companies fail, right? One, because many of them, are, but one of them is you over hire people for, and you build too many departments when you don't have to, where you can outsource tons of everything and you only focus on the core. You should start focusing on the core and if you can outsource. So then in, if, and what happened is when, when you're not producing enough money, you ended up overly concerning over the process and organization of the business instead of the core. When you're a startup, you don't have that problem. You have one or two people over, wear multiple hats. Everyone's doing everything. You don't have a finance department, you have an IT department. You don't have any of that. And you just roll with this because you do everything at once. Then you start taking one more person so he can take off that, that extra hat of you because you can eventually grow that business. That's what happened to you. And that's how you modify yourself, right? You, you learn, okay, I didn't need, maybe I needed those people, but I poorly allocated them to do jobs. Do, doing, the core of the business wasn't yeah. doing the same thing, but now I have all that input. Now let's start all over again. I have all that input from all those links I had and got me all that SEO. Now Uber wants to, get, uh, to, get us, uh, to give us a quote. So you, you ended up restructuring all over again and you learn in the right way, right? One by one, getting more employees until you get to 60. I mean, everything's about leveling up, building the right traits, right? So like, you know, you learn about patience, you learn about, uh, you learn about culture, all these things that seem like buzzwords. Like people will say things, but you don't understand until you really put your hand on the stove. Mm -hmm. And so, I I mean, I think about, um, you know, single grain over the years, it's like, man, it's, didn't know anything about building rapport, didn't know anything about building culture, didn't know anything about like how you actually build out a new uh, uh, department. And so over time, it's just like, yeah, you, you learn these things. And that's why I think entrepreneurship is the ultimate personal growth machine, because you actually get to see kind of what level they're at. Right. And like people are all different. Like, let, let's let's go back to my co-host. He knows he's really bad with people. OK, understanding who you are. I'm going to back up. I'm going to focus on what I'm really good at and then let every that's like his playbook. And then like I have my playbook. There's certain things I'm good at. And also like the most important thing I would say that I I think most entrepreneurs in their early career, even especially in their 20s, they're like, Oh, I'm going to do everything. I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. I'm going to add this. Oh, cool. Scott's yeah. doing a CPG company. I'm going to yeah. try that. I'm going to do like another uh, like, like a cosmetics company yeah, or whatever. I'm going right? to try that. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post yeah. on social yeah. and I'm going to. Like how smart is that? Like you split your attention like five ways. So yeah. you're at 20% level versus someone that's at a hundred percent level. Like why would you. Who do you think is going to win? Yourself? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. But I do believe that actually I had an argument with a lady on LinkedIn like last week <laughs> because I was saying that everybody, I've, actually the comment was, uh, employers that encourage employees to have side hustles are going to win because you're mm-hmm. going to basically allow people the, the the ability to build themselves outside of the organization. And then she was like, well, uh, employers should be paying a decent wage so that the employees shouldn't have a side hustle, which I that's fine. OK, you definitely have to pay a good wage. But the point was you shouldn't be doing the side hustle for the money in the short term. 
you should be doing the side hustle so that you you level yourself the fuck up in yeah. ways that you could never level yourself up in an organization. And, and she was like, well, you can learn in an organization. You will never learn. You get yourself into a rabbit hole with the lady. Yeah, I like yeah it. sometimes that, I do that it. Like, very yeah. smart. <laughs> no, but, but the point is, you will point. never learn yeah. at the at the rate, and you will never get the opportunity to learn the things you can learn as an entrepreneur building a business on the side. Mm -hmm. Forget the money; you can make zero dollars, and you will level up as a person in a way that you will never be able to. But do what would you want to encourage people? I mean, if someone was meant to do it, it would meant to do it, and then I, I mean, you can we support do that. them. We we tell we I actively tell people that they should have an entrepreneurial side hustle, right? Because yeah. I feel like not necessarily everyone should become an entrepreneur, but they should have an entrepreneurial mindset, right? So okay. if it works for you, thank God, right? Like good for you, right? Go do your thing. Like even yesterday there was someone like. But you what know, do you mean when you say encouraging? Because I had employees running their own businesses, and I absolutely yeah. support them on that. But yeah. I don't go out there and say, "Listen, guys, uh, by the way, on your free time when you go home, why don't you start a bit?" I, I didn't really think of going there. Why not? Because, yeah. Why no, not? I didn't say it's bad or good. I yeah. was just thinking, well. In, in my mind, I said, well, if it, if you're meant to be an entrepreneur, you do it. But the amount of people that would be entrepreneurs are very few. It's just the, the way it is, right? Most okay, people so don't. So you don't have to push somebody into an uncomfortable position. If they have like, listen, if there's family stuff that they're taking care of and they have a ton of time they want to put towards their kids and their spouse, like, that's that's fine. It's totally fine Like that you're, you're able to do that. But it's not saying, hey, <laughs> I want you to allocate eight hours of your weekend towards building a business on the side and that's an expectation it's just you allow it if that person is already oh, you allow it, yes, yeah i mean I, I push the fuck out of them uh, maybe so, you do maybe yeah. you do yeah i, I like I'm just how like, many of them ended up building a big side? business that ended up quitting because i told them if you're doing good some of them did well and said it's some time for do, you to actually there's a couple so one guy was doing like he started his e-commerce thing i'm like oh dude how's it going right now and it got up to like you know 80 grand a month i was like dude you should just do it. Yeah. Do your Do thing, it. right? Yeah, how many um, of them? How many of them ended up? Quitting? I think probably like, let's say like three. Three. Um, okay. One guy ended up going to, to work for Gary Vee as his director of brand strategy. So like, I I think again, entrepreneurship is the ultimate personal growth machine. So like, the more you push yourself, you're gonna. Like, I think entrepreneurship is just a mindset. And so I think anybody can get there if they push themselves to do so, because we all come from different walks of life. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't do well in school. I don't know about you guys, but like everyone, if, if like the people that did well in school and didn't do well in school can do it, it's just more so like upgrading your mind to get there. Yeah, well, I think uh, if you if you have if you go back to uh, academics, it gives you a certain comfort that you can get a job if you write a code and then you put yourself in a certain frame. It takes a little bit to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And to say, oh, well, actually, I can do it myself. There's always those aha moments, right? Yeah. I wasn't the guy that building, I, it took me, I was 20 something when I started my company just because I couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. Legally, I wasn't allowed to work here. But it's it's not for everyone For in the sense of if you're not motivated to be an entrepreneur, just don't go there because there's, there's so many raining days and you can make mistakes that can set you back way worse than where you started. Mm -hmm. I would recommend everyone to try it, but I would yeah. say it's... Everyone should try it. Not necessarily everyone's going to win at it. But even if you do try it, you're still going to learn. You're, you're going to have some scar tissue. Yeah, but we're not helps. talking about... So I, wanna, so I want to. I want people to take away from this that it doesn't have to be an all-in, high-risk venture. Mm -hmm. You start writing a newsletter in a niche that you know a lot about, that you're super passionate wow. about, and then you throw on a $5 a month subscription, and then you figure out how to market that, and you yeah. figure out how to blog for yourself, and now you figure out SEO to an extent. Yeah. Like, that's not high risk. That's a, that's that's a, a, that's a hobby that yeah. can turn into a... And it, it what, helps the company, too. And it helps the company. So, so I have someone on my team. She's She helps me with a lot of my, my brand stuff, right? And she's amazing. And, you know, she's helping her, her husband grow her YouTube channel. Like, you know, she's investing on the side. She's doing all these things. I'm like, good, right? Because yeah. all the learnings that you have will translate over into the company. And if it works really well for you, it goes gangbusters, then even better. Yeah, yeah we, right. we, I would look at those that try to build their own channel. Mm -hmm. And some of them was in customer service. I looked at her YouTube channel and said, she's doing amazing. So I moved her from customer service to be one of the company's face. You got leverage. So she can build yeah. her own channel. And now, obviously, she has her own she makes she does really well because she'll work for a bunch of companies. She has one job somewhere else, but she has a bunch of side hustles where yeah. I told her, you want to go and because you understand TikTok, she would go and do content buckets for TikTok for Boxy. And I said, you know, you should go and say, I make companies cool on TikTok. Mm -hmm. That should be on your intro. And you should go and start promoting yourself. And then when companies see this, they said, I need to be cool on TikTok. Who doesn't? Yep. And then you start charging and learn how much you charge. I mean, you can figure it out. You're smart. But but that was something that she, he, she was just keeping her account as, as it is. Mm -hmm. said, no, 
this is the front of your TikTok and Instagram. This is what you should write. Yep. Companies already reaching out, so you should have yep. yourself as, as a company. See, entrepreneurship is about paying it forward too. Like yeah. what you're doing there is like pushing them to become the best version of themselves. So again, I think that's why everyone should have an entrepreneurial mindset. So, I, I love yeah. it. And it's not just about like, I would never recommend somebody do something risky, like take on money if they've never taken on money before. Oh, yeah. Like there's so many, I mean, it's 2022, almost 2023. Mm -hmm even though it's a few months from now, I'm just... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Almost there. We yeah. just... But here the goes, here like goes the, the evergreen. The, here goes the evergreen. The, 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 well, in 2024, they'll be fine. There'll be another 100 episodes. <laughs> yeah. But the point is, there's so many, like, free, like, low-code, no-code co tools, services yeah. that you can leverage to do anything. Mm -hmm. I would... Even even entrepreneurs, I'm like, before you even take on outside, like, people that have, like, fully committed their life to it and are cash flowing. It's like, before you take on outside investment, like, how do you take this? Have you ever seen someone that drive himself into a bad spiral that doesn't want to get out of a failing business, putting everything they had into it. Most, because it's very emotional. Have you seen people? Yes. You seen, yeah. It's a sunk cost fallacy, right? Yeah. But, but to your point, I mean, there's, look, you can pretty, it's very simple, not easy to build a cash flow business that you can do consulting. I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many people that, that talk about building these Shopify, even yeah. though it's not as good anymore, right? But like drop but, shipping through yeah. Shopify. I mean, yeah. like if you figure, if you're good at sourcing products, yeah. you can still make money that way. And by the way, like this is why entrepreneurship is a game. You don't get to go to the next level until you beat the current boss, yeah. and you get, you stay stuck there if you can't beat the current boss. Like that's that's how society. I'm sorry, this is how society should be, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah. Not, not everyone can be an NBA player. I can play basketball, but I can't do NBA. No. So it's not yeah. for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Scott can though. Yeah, no, I don't know. Scared, right? Scott's tall. <laughs> I am tall. I, I don't think I can jump that high. I was never. I'm. I'm a. I'm a big guy. I was more like contact sports. Oh, football. Yeah. There you go. Football, hockey, yeah. rugby. That was my thing. Yeah. Never basketball. I'm not. I'm not that athletic. I can't be running around all day. I'm out of breath pretty quick. It's okay. At least. You, at least you're tall and big. I can't do that. Yeah. Anyway, fair. Yeah. Fair. If you're a good shoot, you can. Uh, not even good at that. Uh, but yeah. All right. I think that's all I got, man. That was well, awesome. That was amazing. Yeah. I enjoyed Eric, this. Yeah. That, that was, was fun. great. Yes. And uh, where should people reach out to you, connect with you, social website? Uh, at Eric O S I U on the Twitters and the Instagrams. Cool. Yeah. We right. can also add your phone number and your personal address where you live so they can come to your home. Yes. Okay? Come on over so to we'll, Miami. We'll do that. <laughs> yeah. Make sure. All right. Perfect. <laughs> Sounds good, man. Thank you. I all appreciate right. Thank it. you, Eric. Thank Thanks. you.